we are going to get started. Oh, more people. So again, good evening. My name is Adara Goldberg and I'm the director of the Holocaust Resource Center and Diversity Council of Kane University. It's a pleasure to see so many faces of those that I know. I'm including some of the students I see from Montclair High School who participate in both the post-baccalaureate program and the high school dual credit program. So it's really wonderful to be able to see everybody here tonight for our very special program. And just a word about what we do. The Holocaust Resource Center was founded in 1982 by survivors of the Holocaust who rebuilt their lives in, the, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Rahway High School is here too, excellent. We hope to see all those students participating. Um, we were founded in 1982 by Holocaust survivors who wanted to ensure that everybody in New Jersey, regardless of background, socioeconomic status, or own lived experience, had access to Holocaust education. And today we continue to honor our survivors and our supporters with the Holocaust Education, um, Holocaust Resource Foundation through our work in collections, commemoration, and education. And tonight's program fits beautifully into our education and outreach portion. And so I am now going to turn things over to one of our teachers, Debbie Maller, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Well, good evening and welcome. And thank you to my, my students that are here as well. Uh, and welcome to a program that I believe is will open your eyes and more importantly, your hearts. I've had the pleasure and honor of knowing Carl Wilkins for over two years. I knew about him as I teach an elective course at Rowway High School on Holocaust and genocide. I knew a little about the genocide in Rwanda and I knew a little about Carl who literally was one of the last Americans to stay behind during that horrific period. He literally saved the lives of hundreds of orphans through his ability to change minds and hearts through nonviolence Although he was surrounded by violence and put his life and his family sometimes at risk. I had the opportunity and pleasure of traveling to Rwanda in 2019 with other educators and we were led by Carl. What I learned was invaluable both as an educator and as a human being. Many of the life lessons I learned from Carl and from the people of Rwanda have stayed with me and have become part of my work with my students. You will leave today knowing what find the good means, and I am sure you will incorporate it in your own life. I am humbled and honored to introduce you to Carl Wilkins, who I'm proud to call my mentor and my friend. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Debbie. That really appreciate that warm welcome, and it's nice to see you this evening and all of you. Nadara and, and your team there, Bridget, we met earlier today. It's nice to, nice to be together with you all this evening. I don't have a whole lot of opportunity to speak with kind of public events with an, okay, almost said older demographic. I don't know if anybody here is older than me, but um, uh, you, you think so, David? Dev, all right, well, we won't argue that. But um, oh, there I see some, oh, boy, we've got some honesty going on here. Um, I am, I am excited because it will, it will um, as we get into conversation, there will be a richness, a breadth, a depth, um, life experiences that I'm really looking forward to uh, shaping our conversation, direct, directing. And as Debbie said, this idea of focusing, uh, finding the good is, um, is my main survival tool, you know, PTSD and other challenges in life. But I'm looking forward to what some of your tools are. And as we as we explore Rwanda from the lens of 1994 and the genocide against the Tutsi, as well as Rwanda today and that 27 year journey between then and now, there's a lot of really uh, inspiring um confusing, <laughs> challenging um, e events that have happened, strategies that I think many of us will agree. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be tough for them to have flipped the script from genocide 
to peace and prosperity like they have without some of these strategies. So I'm, I'm excited to dig into it. I always tell pretty much anybody I share with about Rwanda that I love to start with something other than genocide because Rwanda is so much more than genocide. Uh, and as we'll see later, buying into the idea of repair and reconciliation, people are so much more than, than some of their worst actions, their worst choices. I, I love this picture. Actually, um, when I was traveling around to schools, I haven't done it so much with Zoom. I would play a little couple minutes out of a video that if you go online and you search just Rwanda Vimeo, okay, that web hosting platform, V-I-M-E-O, Rwanda Vimeo, you'll get a picture of some guys in a helicopter and a, um, a shot from a helicopter and that, you know, little play arrow button in the middle of it. You'll know you've got the right one when it's eight minutes and some seconds. You just get It'll be, it'll just, I really encourage you to check that out this evening. This is just one of the screenshots from there. And uh, oh my goodness, you just, you can see the smile on this lady's face and the pineapples that I can tell you, the pineapples are so sweet and the avocados like you never have seen. And well, okay, maybe you have been in some places where, okay, that's not an exaggeration, that right there. And, um, Oh, the other day, somebody served up a little guava juice, made me homesick for Rwanda. Uh, it, it is a very, it's actually not just a country that grows year round, but the most densely populated country in Africa. And for probably six, maybe eight years now, they've been growing enough food to feed themselves, which is not something we can say for so many, um, so many uh, developing countries. Okay, and those of you who raised your hands, maybe older than me or maybe a little younger than me and stuff, 63, born in 57, um, gorillas would be part of your memory of Rwanda. Those mountain gorillas, I was telling the high school students this morning, you should check out this movie, Gorillas in the Mist. It's an old one there, but uh, I think you'll get some interesting insights. Also, yeah, insights that we might want to mimic and maybe not some of the insights. Uh, Diane Fossey wasn't known for her people skills by sure, uh, for sure. Innovation in Rwanda. Man, I'm sorry for that glare this evening. I didn't quite get myself set up. Oh, wait, I know what I can do. I can do that. Yeah. All right, good. Glare gone. Um, the, uh, they are delivering blood with drones to you know, remote clinics and things like that. They've been doing that for several years in Rwanda. Volkswagen assembling probably four different units. Right now they're starting to import electric cars. Um, first cell phone factory on the continent here in Rwanda. And why should they always be developing? Huh? They've got this ambitious goal of being a middle income country by 2035, Shoot, that's just 14 years away. And a high income, I'm not sure what that standard, where the high income country, 2050. And this isn't just, you know, ambitious goals. They, before COVID, they, their um, economic growth rate was over 10%. Uh, there's, there's a lot, of, lot to unpack in the Rwanda of today. I was last there in December, 2019. So what is that? About five, a year and five months. And this was what I call a reverse State of the Union address, where we're all meeting here in this beautiful, you know, high tech convention center. And these big screens that you see on the wall, they have video sites set up all around the country under like a white event tent, you know, like you'd have for a wedding or something. And, and for two days, the president is there listening to the people, all the government ministers, the governors, the mayors and stuff, listening to the people talk about how Rwanda's citizens, the priorities of the citizens are being met by the government services, the government initiatives. And what, what really keeps this from being a major gripe session, which I think it might be if we tried to set up something like this in some of our hometowns, instead of that being a gripe session, they all start with a thank you. You know, thank you for the, um, the refrigeration unit at the airport and the ability now as farmers, we have to send fresh vegetables to Europe. However, the other day when I got there, it was busted down and I, I lost the whole shipment, you know, and the Minister of Agriculture, she was actually, I'm right, okay, hold it right there, buddy. Um, the Minister of Agriculture, in getting rid of my glare, 
Let's make sure I don't lose my TV on my head. Um, okay, glare back. The Minister of Agriculture was sitting right ahead of me right here, and she responded with some of the issues and the way they were addressing it. But then the president, who's listening to everything, he's not micromanaging. He's not, there's an MC who takes the the um, video calls or from the microphone on the floor in the convention center or another convention center 10 miles away with about 2000 young people. All of these people having a voice, which is huge in building sustainable peace. We all know right here in America, especially recently, what happens when we don't feel we have a voice. And so these two days, uh, which is done every year, it's written in their constitution, um, the president is there, but he's only entering in if he feels like the people's needs, their interests are not coming first. For example, this time he pushes the little button on his microphone, the camera zooms in, you see the red around the mic, you know it's live. And he says to the minister, now, wait a minute, was this farmer compensated for that loss, that lost shipment? Because, you know, that was on us, the government facility there at the airport and stuff and well he hadn't been and and it's just I could give you several examples of when the president stepped in and said well, well wait that answer isn't sufficient you know and I just okay I love this image of this is broadcast on the radio television all around on YouTube all around the globe actually I love the image of a grandpa sitting there with his let's just call this a little transistor radio sitting there with his little transistor radio that he listened to during the genocide that was instructing about killing the tootsies the minority and we haven't seen the body of you know john smith and somebody said they saw it down at the corner of fifth and elm or something that same radio 27 years later um they're listening to it as they hear the president going to bat for different issues where the government programs didn't quite meet the priorities of the people. So this, this innovation and this idea of empowering the people, giving the people voice, it's a huge part of Rwanda's journey. I um, The new stadium I usually play for high school kids just to see a little bit of basketball in Rwanda. You know, it really changes the image of just thinking Rwanda is genocide to understand the diversity and, and complexity and the progress that's happening in the country right now. I, I spared you the sound clip, but um, so we're going to go back and we're going to try to do like a seven minute summary of what happened in 94 through the lens of our family. And then we'll look at the journey since then, then we'll have some conversation. But please don't hesitate. I don't have you all on one screen on my iPad. I've got 16 of you. I think you're on two different or three screens here. Um, so feel free to just unmute and say, wait a minute, or, or use that raise your hand function or uh, put something in the chat. Because, you know, don't feel like I don't want to interrupt the guy and throw him off. My own head interrupts me plenty and throws, <laughs> and I usually come back on track. So don't, please don't hesitate to, to question or clarification or I don't finish a sentence. We moved there in the spring of 1990, our three young children. We're partnering with the people of Rwanda to build schools, operate clinics. It was just really rewarding work. Our kids, great place to raise our kids. Um, everybody was always watching out for our children in the neighborhood. We all watched out for each other's kids. And in fact, um, we used to always joke, it, it wasn't hard to find this little shirtless redheaded kid running around the neighborhood, but they were building relationships during the four years before this horrible thing that's now known as genocide, the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi happens. The, the president's plane is shot down, he's killed. A small group of extremists have been for more than a year, close to two years, intensely constructing a narrative around identity which many of you are familiar with, whether it's the Holocaust or other, other genocides or mass atrocities around this world, this idea going on here in America today too, of constructing a narrative around different identities that will serve the purpose of the leaders, of the politicians. And you can ask through questions if we go deeper in the, in the history of Rwanda in terms of the narrative that they were building, but it was basically right now launching the genocide saying the Tutsis um, have killed our president. 
Rwanda had three major ethnic groups there. You can see barely maybe the word Hutu, the majority is crossed out on this ID card. The word Tutsi is not, the word Twa is crossed out. And so this person is a Tutsi. Now, don't, don't fall for that kind of simplistic idea that, oh, there's Hutus and Tutsis and Twa. No, there's Hutus and Tutsis and sometimes on the side Twa. There wasn't as much integration, honestly, with the Twa people, but Hutu and Tutsi people, you speak the same language, you go to school together, you work in the gardens together, you're gonna fall in love. The stereotypes of taller Tutsis and darker Hutus got very blurred as intermarriage continued on here. So these ID cards are gonna be, they're gonna be deadly during the genocide because people are not being, people are people are being discriminated against but not based on anything about their character or who they are but strictly on this ethnic identity seeing the the tutsi group the group of extremists didn't want to share power they had there was um an agreement let's see where are we with our agreement right here after three years of war that everybody is going to share power together and what's called the arusha accord and unfortunately you know this small group of extremists said no to share power is worse than defeat and so backing up here um they're going around with microphone, you know, speakers on vehicles. The Tutsis have killed our president. Get out, secure your neighborhood, drag a drag a tree across the road, check everybody's ID card. The, this construction of an enemy, the Tutsi people, largely through a radio station, Milk Lean Radio, is now being launched at the extermination campaign. And we really can't comprehend what it's like to lose 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 people in a day at the hands of their government, their neighbors, sometimes their pastors and priests. This idea, um, the power of words, yeah. So the planners are of this, this is kind of their mantra. Our world would be better without you in it. That's where genocide thinking, I believe, comes from. And it is just a small, a relatively small group of men and women. Uh, this man right here with the beard in the center will be made the prime minister when they, when they launch a coup and take over the government. And we'll meet this guy a little later this evening, but it'll be a sketch. Just thought I'd point him out though. And this group of men and women who most likely were probably all in their own various churches the Sunday before the plane is shot down. That was Easter Sunday. Rwanda is a country where 90% of the people, 80, 90% of the people were in church almost every weekend. So that's another layer to try to peel back how genocide happens in a country um, that is supposed to be so Christian. I, I, when I say 80, 90%, the vast majority were Christian, a small Muslim population. Uh, mixed in there. And so since we had had three years of war, they had had this Arusha peace accord, the UN sent soldiers there, armor personnel carry saying, we're here for you. It's a great idea, Rwanda. We're, we're here to help you with this broad based transitional government. But the big tragedy of their presence is that they're going to create a massive false sense of security. I, I was just thinking the other day, it would have been a whole lot, I bet you so many more people would have lived if they would have had a message under those big UN letters that said for UN personnel protection only. These, this armored vehicles, these guns will not be used to protect others, anyone other than the UN. And the 2,500 UN soldiers who, the vast majority of people who were there, including the Canadian colonel who was in charge of the UN said we had enough to stop the genocide if we would have gotten support from New York. Another big story, and oh my, I'm moving away from my five or six minutes. The American government, along with all the other governments, says we've got to evacuate our citizens. Laura, the young consulate officer, is in charge of evacuating the 257 Americans. I'm on the radio talking with her because I was responsible for a group of Americans. I used to go to the embassy for for sit reps, I was what they called a warden. And I'm um, telling, uh, communicating to our people, the embassy says, put a white t-shirt around your vehicle. 
antenna or somehow put it up there and drive to the closest assembly point, the ambassador's home, the international school, the embassy. And I tell Laura, I'm sending the dental clinic people to the ambassador's home over and she goes, good copy. And now I'm also sending my family to the ambassador's home over. And she says, what do you mean you're sending them? And I, I said, well, I'm, I'm not leaving. And she says, you don't have a choice. We are all, everybody, ambassador, nobody is staying behind. And I said, well, I do have a choice as a private American citizen. It goes back and forth a little bit. Finally, she says, well, we'll sign on a piece of paper that you refuse the help of the United States government to leave. That was no small thing for me. It might sound like a simple thing, but as I wrote, you know, tore a uh, piece of paper out of my daughter's three ring binder um, and wrote in pencil that message and signed it. I still didn't fully understand though, what all was ahead, the intensity, the numbers, and how long it would go on. But here's what we understood. We had been told by the embassy, bring your family. At this time, my parents were actually visiting. I'm, I'm just a year older than my dad was 27 years ago. Um, now, for me, that is. Uh, bring your family, but don't bring any Rwandans. Um, we'll be stopped at roadblocks. Many of the European countries flew out. We're driving to Burundi to the south. It doesn't matter if they're Hutu or Tutsi. You can't often tell. You just can't bring any Rwandans. And our family had had kind of grown. Um, the young lady who lived and worked in our home, loved on our kids, always say that's fast track to family, huh? And she had a Tutsi ID card. The young man came in the evening, watchman, he had a Tutsi ID card. And we're thinking these people have, have given us so much privilege as foreigners. Can we use that privilege to help protect these people in our house? And so in effect, we're being asked to split up our family, which we just couldn't see our way to do that. So Teresa took the kids to safety with my mom and dad, and I stayed with this young lady and this young man, and fortunately they will survive. Here she is with her sons, her husband. Um, the other young man survived as well. Teresa will take the kids to Nairobi, where they will spend the rest of the genocide. Um, there will not only be the young lady and the young man, but a pastor and his wife who had Hutu ID cards weren't threatened as such. I mean, if you weren't going along with the genocide, you were at risk, okay? But an older couple, you know, Hutu ID cards, they'd be pretty much just, you know, kind of asked to move aside. But they, they chose when I invited them to come to my home, a more recent picture. She will be the first one to talk to people when they come to the gate wanting to kill the people in our home. She'll de-escalate. She'll talk like, a, like, a, like an auntie to them. He will have this deep, He's like a deep well of wisdom. He'll tell me, you know, after three weeks of stuck in our house, look, if you want to do anything outside to help anybody, you got to build a relationship with the people in power, which is going to be the coup who's taken over, the people who are running the genocide. And so I will meet Colonel Renzaho after some years after he'll be uh, arrested, hunted down, arrested and convicted, and he's spending life imprisonment right now. Um, but during that time, we'll develop a, a sort of relationship. Um, he, he will give me a travel permit. You know, I'll say, look, I'm here. You, you actually said on the radio, all the aid organizations were gone. Well, I just want you to know, sorry, I should just forget it right then. Go there, but let's hope that will help us a little bit. Yeah, I just want, um, I just want you to know that ADRA is not gone. OK, we're here to help those who are suffering. I'm not saying Tootsie, of course. This is a very fine line to walk during this time. He'll say, yeah, there's some orphanages that you can help. And uh, he'll give me this travel permit that will get me through the roadblocks. I'll meet Damas and his wife, 34 years old at the time. Um, he'll have more than 400 kids by the time the genocide so parents over. Parents are looking for a safe place for their kids. And, and I'll find out when I first go to visit there that the children are dying from diarrhea, from dysentery. So they need water, they need medicine and any food we can come up with. Couldn't have done that with my, without two of my colleagues that were able to work with me during the genocide. Dawson from ADRA, the aid organization that uh, we were all working with and Gasikwa who actually had 40 people he was protecting in his home when they came to kill him. He greets the killers with kindness.
which I'm really tempted to go deeper in that story, but I'll let you ask if we want to go deeper there. The genocide will end after three months. It'll be the Rwandan Patriotic Front. See, at the time of independence, 1962, the years leading up to it, there was persecution, there was pers there was fighting and killing, uh, there was targeting, that's the right word, against the Tutsi people. Many of these young men and women, their parents fled in 59, 60, 62. Many of them were born in Uganda as refugees. They'll try to come back for 30 years peacefully, won't be allowed back, which is really interesting because today, before they were told, no, no, Rwanda's overpopulated, you can't come back, you're just trouble. Today, Rwanda has a very different uh, policy towards Rwandans coming home, which we'll dive into. But, but this is the group of soldiers who will drive the perpetrators, the, the extremists, out of power and out of the country. And it'll be up to them to set up a new government. I'll be reunited with Therese and the kids. Unbelievable memories here for me when I see this picture, stuff I, I dreamed about every night of the genocide. But for the people of Rwanda, how do you memorialize? How do you, how do you recognize honor? And how do you continue to live in the wake of more than a million people killed? You know, seven million in the country and, and, and more than, you know, a million of those seven killed, everybody's affected either by someone killed or someone who did the, excuse me, the killing. So we're gonna um, we're gonna look at Rwanda's journey, how they how they decided to start to put things together. But in order to to do that, to kind of frame that, um, okay, let me look at my time. <laughs> that was ridiculous when I said six or seven minutes. All right, uh, one of the things we need to look at, I think, is cynicism. Okay, and let's look at cynicism before we look at the repair process. Let's just talk about cynicism right up front. All right, this idea, I, I choose to look at it like on a spectrum, on a, on a continuum. All of us have a certain amount of cynicism, a distrust, but we also have different levels of hope. And what I would like to frame Rwanda's story in is in this journey from cynicism to hope and, and some very concrete ways, not just I kind of hope so, something ethereal or something, but very concrete ways. And one of them that Rwanda is doing is moving from a punitive mindset to a restorative mindset in terms of the people who committed genocide. Now, this um, it's, it's really tough. Cynicism thrives in a good guy, bad guy mentality, which for years, many of us involved in Holocaust genocide education were like, there's no such thing. The potential is within, e within each one of us. Um, but instead of just saying to people, there's no such thing, and people are like, well, I don't know about you, but that guy seems like a bad guy to me. Try to frame it in the, in the idea of trajectories of people's life. Yes, people may be on a path that's harmful. Or they may be on a path that is primarily healing. And, in, and for our conversation, it might be helpful to say, you know, this is, this is rather a polarizing response, a polarizing mentality, or a restorative mentality. But if we think about people on a trajectory, on a path, the potential for change is there, which is what I think restorative practices are all about. If we don't believe people can change, we're kind of sunk at front right from the beginning, which is why I think it's important to talk about that. I really appreciate Brian Stevenson, who um, founded the Equal Justice Initiative. And, and if you haven't met Brian or heard of him, just go on YouTube. There's a film that came out, um, Michael Jordan. It's, it's a great, um, it's a powerful, inspiring story. But, but Brian says, I believe each person is more than the worst thing they've ever done. Rwanda is more than genocide. The UN is more than their failures in Rwanda. You can go on with this idea of one thing thinking. Um, and the story, no, with our time though, um, we showed up with water at the orphanage one day, Gasequa and I, and, and we found ourselves surrounded by 50 guys ready to massacre everybody. And the short version of this story, if you wanna get kind of the longer version of the whole thing, there's a 40 minute film on YouTube. We have it on there right now, it's temporary, but anyway, called I'm Not Leaving, 
full movie. If you Google that, that's where these sketches are coming from and you'll get the bigger story there. But basically um, they will pause when they see a foreigner there. Uh, I will get some help from uh, Philip at the Red Cross will contact, there are probably about eight or 10 other foreigners in the city besides myself. Philip, a Swiss guy, will help contact police and some police officers will come to kind of try to hold the fort, but they know they can't do it through the night. I will go looking for reinforcements. I'll end up back in the office of the colonel who gives me the travel permit. But remember the guy I said, pointed out in the photograph, the prime minister? He's making a surprise visit to Kigali that day. They moved out of the capital when things got too hot, moved their center of government farther in, uh, south in the country. And um, uh, the secretary will tell me, ask him to stop a massacre, which is crazy. He's in charge of the genocide. At least I think it's crazy, but she knows a lot. I didn't know. Boy, big lesson in listening to local people, okay? But in any case, he will stop the massacre. And the point that I wanted to bring this story in is that I will go the next day to the orf. They moved the orphans out to a little safer location, but it was under so much duress. The militia was back again to try to kill everybody. And it was a standoff between soldiers and militia. Quick kids, get in the bus, get in. No, no, don't bring anything. Everybody get in. We got to get out of here. So they didn't have their blankets, cooking pots. I'll go back to collect that stuff with my friend Gasiqua and the same guys will be there that were there to massacre everybody. Only now they're looting and I'm sure they're gonna kill me. But I had remembered to ask the Colonel for a, for a, trav, uh, a, a permit to take the orphan belongings through the roadblocks. So I bring this letter out of my pocket and the leader of the killing squad reads it, who is a guy who, by the way, I'll meet 21 years later in a prison in Rwanda, very surprised meeting, a very angry meeting for my part, which I didn't know I had so much anger. If you want to get into that story, I'll leave that with you. But this guy, I'll give him the letter and he will say, no, nope, uh, yeah, yeah. He'll say, of course, the orphans need their stuff. And he'll bark orders to his guys to help me load the truck. And for a couple hours, these guys will be helping me. I, I bring this out as a potential. Just I know it's an extreme example, but the, the potential that everybody has to change course, to change the trajectory of their life, to, um, to basically get off that freeway and take an exit. I, I, in the little book I wrote called I'm Not Leaving, um, I wrote these words down. When we engage our mind and our muscles, they helped me find a truck, but they had low sides. And, and we had to figure out how can we haul more stuff? Oh, get the tables out of the cafeteria, stand them on end. We're carrying these, tables. one guy with a machine gun over his shoulder on one end of the table, I'm on the other end of the table. When we engage our minds and muscles in acts of service, it changes the way we see ourselves and the way we see others. So I have been working for close to six months now on what I'm calling a hope-based process. Okay, to be honest, it depends who I'm talking to. A hope-based process to address, I had a group the other day, racial injustice. But I think the principles are very similar to address polarization, to address division. Okay, often we dive right in trying to engage the other and we come away with a bloody nose thinking, oh, that was really stupid. They'll never, they're impossible. And we haven't taken time to prepare ourselves, which is where I was going with this continuum from cynicism to hope. This idea of preparing ourselves, emotional intelligence, a lot of different acts, um, strategies to prepare ourselves and then to reframe the other. Instead of simply defining them by the one thing that makes us the most angry, which dehumanizes, we, we really work on intentionally reframing, understand, rehumanizing, understanding better their perspective before we try to engage. So we'll see with our time this evening if we get into the, this three-step process of preparing ourselves reframing, you know, we might see a MAGA hat or a, or a Black Lives Matter sign in the yard and we think, oh, that's all I need to know. You don't have to tell me anything else. You know, this one thing thinking that we so easily engage in and, and the strategy finding the good in dealing with this one thing thinking before we engage. And of course, throughout all of this, we have stories during the genocide and post-genocide that help us wrap our mind around these concepts. So 
where I want to just end with you this evening, and so then we'll come into our conversation, um, is will okay, let's move on. Hope that's grounded not only in a potential for good in everybody, that's a serious mind shift for many of us. We're not totally in the hope way, but we're moving from, we're believing that the potential for good, if we choose, is in everyone. Then we have a, a, a chance at, at, at this really radical idea of a restorative mindset, which Rwanda is the one who really took this big challenge. After the genocide, they had hundreds of thousands of people accused of killing their neighbors. Logistically, not enough judges, lawyers. They, it would take more than 100 years. People are in prison for a year, two years, five years. When are they ever going to come to trial? Excuse me. So Rwanda could have picked up this idea of genocide, you know, stems from thinking this, and my world be better without you in it. This idea, who's going to argue my world would be better without people who committed genocide in it? This is why I say it's radical, because they're saying, no, we are flipping the script. That does not break the cycle of violence. And so our world would be better with you in it, no matter what you've done. And the way we're going to make this safe for everyone and try to bring about healing is based on this idea that people can change course, okay? Kind of like, okay, sorry, this is for the UK tomorrow morning, so they're driving on the other side of the road, but it's like, you can take an exit from the freeway. You know, you can, you can change course. And the, and the president of Rwanda said, you know what? Here's the three keys that we had to this restorative journey. We're gonna stay together no matter what. We're going to be accountable to each other, and we're going to think big. Now, I was in the stadium when he made this statement 20 years after the genocide, and I was listening, and I've been thinking on those three things for seven years now, and I, I think they're a pretty good uh, recipe if, if a relationship, if a marriage is in trouble, you know, much less a country. And so uh, with all of these hundreds of thousands of people who have been accused of killing their neighbors, they can't do regular court system. They're saying, okay, let's go from a punitive response for the people who committed genocide to a restorative response. Initially, for some of us, they're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Genocide is like one of the worst crimes we can imagine. Why would you start this shift on people who did genocide? I mean, what, let's try it with regular criminals. But out of necessity in Rwanda, they, they, they just have too many people. They've got to find a way to handle it differently. They go back, um, and let me just give you so the detail. Here's just the, the quick, quick and dirty version. With punitive, we're looking at blame and punishment. Typically, lawyers, maybe judges. With restorative, we're trying to understand the harm and then have a repair plan. And to really understand the harm and to have a sustainable, a repair plan that has a chance of working, we need all of the voices. See, at the top of the pyramid with restorative is healing, not justice. However, you won't get to healing without justice. We often will stop with our version of justice and healing doesn't happen. The cycle of violence doesn't get broken. So here's how it played out in Rwanda. In your community, pick nine people you trust, and we're going to give them a crash course as judges slash facilitators. You prisoners who've been in prison for two, five years, no trial yet, you wanna, you wanna get a quick, uh, a shortcut home? Come to the community where you committed your crime and confess in front of the community. Thursday afternoon, close school, close business, everybody to the soccer field. The nine people you chose, oh, and by the way, Rwanda in their new constitution, 30% of all decision makers in the country, bodies, parliament, nine judges in your town, minimum of 30% have to be women. The role of women, gender equality, massive part in this restorative repair plan in Rwanda. They're wearing sashes that say people of integrity, a person of integrity, people chosen by their community. And then the community, instead of a peer, uh, a, a jury of your peers, you kind of have a judge group of your peers, and then you have your whole community, you confess, people in the community ask you questions, the judges listen, they process, they ask questions. Basically, 
we're trying to understand the harm that happened in the genocide. And while, okay, this is probably worth backing up for a second. While consequences on punitive is usually punishment, consequences on restorative here is about taking responsibility and being part of the repair plan, repairing that harm. Very co collaborative as opposed to adversarial. And so as these people are listening to the confession, basically the truth is coming out. Where my parents were buried, where my grandma was buried. Did my nephew see their uncle killed, uh, their, my brother killed first, or was he killed? I know these things might, have much, might not have much to do with justice, but they have a lot to do with healing. And so this starting to talk together, engagement and truth in the community, super empowering for the people in the community. Many developing countries, a, 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 um, a residual impact of colonialism was the stripping of your agency, of your ability or, or your belief that you can solve your own problems. And Rwanda is massive in this idea that you can solve your own problems. I don't care if you've been to high school, that's not the most important thing here. Are you a person of integrity? Which is really interesting because the genocide is built around a, um, a narrative, around the identity, ethnic identity of people. The new identity in Rwanda is, is very consistent throughout the country saying our identity is not about whether we're Hutu or Tutsi or where we're born or anything. Our identity is about our character. It's about integrity. It's about equality. So from Gachacha, the people would then go to what's called a Tij camp, where they would be involved in projects to benefit the community community, Build, building roads, radical terracing, uh, building homes for widows. I'm here with high school kids in 2015, and uh, you wouldn't tell by the smiles on their faces that they're talking to 200 men and women who've committed genocide or who raped, stole, somehow were accomplice in the genocide, you know? And, and there's no fence, no walls. The guards don't have guns. This is collaborative. This is where people are getting a chance to reinvent themselves, not to pay back. How do you pay back for killing people, huh? But to show that you are more than your worst choice, that this one thing thinking can be changed. Um, they'll go to church on, some of them will go to church on the weekend, put on civilian clothes, I imagine some even join the local choir. You know, this, this reinvent and reintegrate to the community. And uh, many more stories, but let's, uh, let's call it there. And um, what did I leave us? 15, did we, we planned on an hour, is that right, Adara? Yeah, about an hour, we have time. So if there's okay. questions, we have so, time. So yeah, um, let me just give you one last thing. Kachacha ended in 2011, but they're like, this is so valuable. This empowering of the people, this solving problems as close to the problem as possible, this truth telling, this community involved in the repair plan, we've got to get that into our other, they were running like parallel legal systems. One to try to handle all the people in genocide, one for regular crimes. And the regular crime one was like many others in the world, punitive. How do we get restorative concepts into our punitive legal system? Well, one of, to me, one of the brilliant ways to do it is start at the grassroots. Before anybody brings anybody to court, okay, not quite anybody, but most anybody, there's certain levels of crimes I'm still investigating to figure out. You know, I don't think, a, I don't think these people today handle murder. Or, or accusation of murder. But so many of the crimes are not murder. They're, they're problems between people. So the community ends up, um, okay, my battery just told me I need to plug in. The, the, the people have to bring um, their problems to a Boonzi, this mediation committee before it could ever get to court. And Abunzi solves 70% of the cases. Once again, people elected by the community, five-year term, volunteers, 30% female. This, to me, this is super exciting. So, uh, 
yeah, I just on the chat, you're welcome to put your questions there. I'd love to hear directly from you if you're comfortable. What do you want to, and I know it's possible that I explained it perfectly so there's no questions. No. <laughs> what often happens is I feel like I've hit people with a fire hose. It's a lot of information in a short amount of time, but some of you have been digging into this already. And I, I perhaps some of you are involved in, in restorative justice initiatives in America. I used to think restorative justice was only about legal system when I first started learning. And then I realized, no, no, no. In our schools, in our workplace, the restorative justice principles are a life, a way of living. Well, I see one question that came through, which okay. has to do, which is asking, were all people supportive of the community-based reconciliation model? No, I mean, you know, we're people, people are people. And uh, for example, they did away with the death penalty in Rwanda and the president didn't just do away with it. I mean, like plastic bags were just done away with. When you're landing in Rwanda, they'll say, uh, put your seat backs and tray tables in the upright position. And if you have any plastic bags, leave them on the plane because they're illegal in this country. That was just kind of by mandate. But the do away with the death penalty, the president traveled around the country having town hall meetings with people. And you can imagine people saying, what? Now is when we need a death penalty after the horrors of what they did to my family and stuff. So you definitely are going to, people are people and, and not everybody is going to buy into restorative. I mean, I'll be honest with you. There's many times where I'm like, oh, restorative is beautiful, but mm, lock them up and throw away the key sounds better. But that's because of my upbringing, not because I've been exposed again and again and again to restorative thinking. So it was, it's a process and a journey for everybody. And I wouldn't even say that, you know, they did more than a million. Actually, the last figure I heard was 1.9 million cases. Not 1.9 million people, because a person could have multiple cases, okay? 1.9 million cases on the, on the soccer field, people witnessing that. I kind of maybe romanticized a little bit in my head and thought, boy, isn't it cool now in the marketplace when somebody is uh, caught doing something unfair, people don't think about blame and punish. They think about harm and repair. It's not a quick process. It takes time. And so it is going to be, um, there are going to be people who are going to say this is too soft. And I totally get that because you're still, you're still grieving and mourning and angry about the brutal torture and massacre of your innocent family members. You know, some people said, come back to this picture of Gachacha. When some people heard what Rwanda was planning outside of Rwanda, I don't know, maybe inside too, but especially I heard about it outside. They're like, you are insane. You're going to start another genocide. You're going to open this can of worms in the middle of the community. You're going to have chaos. You're going to have riots and killing and, and everything else. So this is, your question is really appropriate because it begins to open up the door on what a complex and um, uh, emotional traumatic uh, on a traumatized population. And we're trying to address seemingly impossible uh, problems. So no, I, the general consensus is this was the best solution we could have come up with. And many people benefited. And a lot of the benefit would have to do with if you were ready to buy into the ideas of restorative justice. Are you ready for somebody uh, in your community who's been involved in genocide to come to your church? Are you gonna greet them with suspicion? Understandable if you are, and I don't criticize anybody who does, but the role of the choice of the individual citizen can't be overemphasized in this process that happened there. And so it really still leaves. It's not like, oh, this is a no brainer. We're all going to do it. No, it really takes some against the current thinking and choices for this to have the success it has had. Hey, thank you. Um, Ted has a question. You want to unmute yourself, Ted? 
Yeah. Hi. Um, I was going to ask, I think you said you met up with the, the, the militia uh, leader 20 years later. And I wondered, yeah. I wondered how that meeting like helped with like the healing process and like putting a, like speaking to him in a way. Thanks for asking about that. Um, this will be um, my, my best abbreviated version. I'm, I'm with those same high school kids you saw in the other picture. We're visiting the oldest prison on that same trip to Rwanda. We're in the warden's office and he invites in some prisoners that the students can talk to. Amazing two hour conversation but one of the prisoners brought in ends up being that leader of the killing squad. I asked the several questions because I didn't recognize the guy. And, and finally, my last question, what kind of car did you drive? And when he says a green Mercedes station wagon, I know that's the guy. And that's when I was just really overwhelmed with, with like a sick anger. I mean, when I say a sick anger, I felt like throwing up. I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't realize how, how much anger there was inside. I mean, I realized later it wasn't all towards him, but there was a significant amount from the different interactions I had, people I knew who had watched him kill their family members, horrific stuff. And, and so that evening I had a Skype with my wife and I said to her, she says, Hey, how was the day? And I'm like, was horrible. I met the guy who killed Johnson's mother. And I, I told her, I said, he doesn't even deserve to have a name. They say he and his gang killed more than 2000 people. I don't even know how I'm going to sleep. She's a really good listener. She doesn't talk about forgiveness. That would have just made me angry worse. And, uh, and then I go, wait a minute, I know what I'm going to do. And this next part that I'm going to tell you, this is a part that I want to describe to you what I did, not prescribe to you what I did. I'm not saying everybody should do this, but when I get knocked off center, I mean, really, really knocked off center, um, there's this power in pausing. And in my pause uh, to get recentered, I go to what I believe about God. So this is not a little you know, evangelical thing or anything. I don't believe in trying to convince people of stuff. I believe in describing and loving, and that's what we can do, not try to convince. So here's what I, here's my description. I started reciting to her five things that I believe about God that help get me re-centered. God's always with me. God takes great delight in me, not because what I do or don't do. I'm his child. God's love comes. My heart often, you know, music. God has everything I need for every situation. And I'm just, it's like a mantra. I'm reciting this to my wife. Everything I need for every situation. God's my shepherd, my redeemer. I go, ah, if, if, if this is true to reset, I believe it for me. It has recentered me again and again and again. Then it should be true for Gregoire. And I said, I've got to substitute his name in here. Now, this is descriptive. This is just my journey, okay? I'm not recommending this for people. I'm just telling you my journey. And I, I was fine with the first one. God's always with Greg Wall. But then I'm like, God takes great delight in Greg. Ah, no. Boo. Never. The guy was involved with killing. But then I realized I am working from a perspective of behavior. And my understanding of God is not about behavior. It's about a child. Now, I'm not going to go deeper in all of this, but I'm going to tell you what I think it means potentially to somebody who doesn't believe in God. For me, this experience with God is my best understanding of unconditional love. And as I was wrestling with meeting this man again and my anger and bitterness with him, I was journaling about my deepest understanding of unconditional love. And then putting him into the picture, into that journal entry. And I know this is super radical stuff. So I don't, you know, feel like uh, people are like, oh, good, that makes sense. <laughs> I hope you might see some sense in terms of unconditional love. But if you don't, I hear you. And when I say keep writing, I had to keep coming back to this, not defining him by one thing, but this was my version of rehumanizing him in my mind, not because he deserved it, because I didn't think he deserved it, but because when I dehumanize people, I dehumanize myself. And so as, as my ability to become a more compassionate, more empathetic, more caring human, I think is directly connected to my ability to rehumanize 
people that I am struggling with or that I have framed as one thing thinking. And so the second part of the Greg Loss story is a year later when I go back, this time I know where he is in prison. I asked to speak to him on purpose. We go into that same office and um, I said, Greg Loss, last year when I met you, I was so angry. Uh, I, I didn't even want to shake your hand. I don't want to be angry. I, I want to apologize for being so angry. And he says, I could tell that I was angry. Um, I could tell. I, I was just, I recognized you the moment I came in the room. I was happy to see that you were still alive. I've thought about you often over the years. Now, I haven't given you the full background of the interaction with this guy. I've given you a couple little snapshots. But for me to hear him say that really kind of was knocking me off center again <laughs> because, because it sounded so human. And I had, I had thought about him for 20, 22 years by now. And every time I thought about him, it was Greg Law, the leader of the Killing Squad. And, um, okay, <laughs> I hesitate with this next part because in such a short time here in the context can really be misunderstood, but we talked for a little while longer. Um, we stood up to shake hands and instead of shaking hands, it ended up a hug, which I probably should have seen coming because Rwandans are big huggers. You hug and you do like a little kind of air kiss, three of them when you're hugging a Rwandan, one, two, three, that's typical culture there I of course never expected to hug this guy and when I step back and I'm and I'm drying my eyes and he's got his prison uniform and drying his eyes man the first thing that comes to my mind is I can't tell Johnson a young man who was nine at the time of the genocide we're now good friends he's got a little beautiful one-year-old I could show you a picture of him I said I can't tell Johnson that I just hugged the guy who killed his mother it felt like I was betraying all of the 2000 plus people that he and his gang had killed. But I realized, it took me like nine months to finally journal about this, that staying angry and bitter at somebody is not the best way to honor the people who were killed. And I, and I thought if I'd have been killed and my kids found a way to be free from anger and bitterness, not necessarily reconcile. I don't think reconciliation is a universal invitation in terms of people struggling with this. I think that getting free of anger and bitterness, which is toxic, which can destroy us and the relationships most important to us, I think that's a universal invitation to get free from anger and bitterness. But this idea that hanging on to anger and bitterness somehow honors the people who were killed, that just didn't fly with me when I started writing it out in my journal. So, so this idea um, of, you know, from your question about, this story and the healing moving forward, it, it really um, obviously drove home to me how hard it is to get free of anger and bitterness. And I wasn't, I didn't even have my wife and children killed. So I think I'm angry about stuff. Well, what if, what if, you know, things a hundred times worse had happened to me? So understanding the level of, um, of difficulty and the grip that anger and bitterness can have on us, that's part of that journey. Understanding the importance of not defining people, you know, part of me would say, okay, if you don't define this guy by all of the people that he murdered, you are again, you're, you're just way out in left field, you know, you're out in the bushes somewhere. And I'm, and I'm like, no, wait a minute, I am not forgetting what he has done. But that, uh, continual firing of neural pathways about the worst that people have done. Personally, I don't find healing with that. I didn't find healing from PTSD and other things like that from that strategy either. I'm no way letting him off the hook for what he did. But staying angry and bitter to me doesn't keep him on the hook, so to speak. Do you, is there something there that you'd like to kind of talk a little more or please feel free to push back on? It's still a journey I'm trying to understand and unpack myself. Oh, that's fine, thank you. Well, thanks for your question. 
other people with questions, just feel free to jump in. And I really hope that the ideas of some of the principles we talked about earlier are not shoved aside by more radical stories like this. If a radical story like this is more disturbing and uh, derailing, lay it aside, please. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll look at some of the principles we were exploring earlier. Hi, I just have a thought. Um, thank you. Kara. Yes, hi. N nice thank to meet you. So much. Nice to meet you too, this is amazing. Um, I, you know, I know, see, I came in a little bit late because I was, I had a class, but um, sure. I'm just listening, I, I'm just listening to you talking about this, you know, more radical side of the story, but at the same time, everything that you talked about, about your process of healing and restoration and, you know, yes, reconciliation is not an open invitation, but everything that you just said resounded with me in such a way that it's, it's what Gachacha was built on. So how I think could it? You know, like it just, I, that I was think my it really, it sets us, it sets us free and it empowers us. And, and, you know, people who, who didn't know all the details, sometimes it's like, why do you want to know? Why did you dig up mass graves? And why did you want to know all these things? But we have, we can't process what we don't know. And, and we may not even get all the pieces to the puzzle, but we can get some of the pieces to the puzzle till we can come to a place where I don't like to say we can move on or we, um, you know, yeah, we move on or something. But I think that we can get to a place where these horrible traumatic memories take um, a more appropriate space in our memory and they don't dominate everything. And that's why learning the details and, and starting to engage in conversation again, to me is, does make a lot of, practical sense right right thank you no thank you yeah grab whatever you need no problem it's unlocked. It's unlocked. uh yes i had a question can Please, you hear me let me just yes okay. i hear you and i'm just switching to speaker view so i can see okay gail yes. nice to meet you no Okay. Um, I had a question. With the uh, mediation committee, yeah. um, if there is a case that is being presented at the mediation committee, how long does it usually take um, to well, actually come to yeah. an amicable agreement or resolution? Gail, honestly, I'm just about six weeks old into this mediation committee, maybe two months oh. old. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I, it's a great question. Uh, okay. I've been told that it's much faster than the court, but they haven't. I haven't gotten nailed down with people. I've got some scheduled appointments with people in Rwanda and stuff to ask some of these questions. And so I appreciate that one. And they're, you know, they do say that it's so much faster than a typical court case, but I don't know the specifics for you, which I think is another practical thing in terms of dragging out and once again finding healing. Right. As opposed yes. to really justice. I hope that mm -hmm. I, and, and, and I may be missing something in that idea that, you know, the top of the pyramid is healing, not mm -hmm. justice, but we can't find justice. Sorry, we can't find healing without the justice as part of that journey. And, and so I'm, I'm still unpacking that one. But thanks for asking about it. Now, um, I just had one last question. Um, the uh, mediation committee do do the people actually go to that other committee where they have to confess what they did is that prior to the mediation so i think it's a gotcha i think the yeah name? that's right gachacha no gachacha uh -huh. finished in 2011 so it finished oh, oh, 10 I years see. ago oh i and, see um, uh just one second no problem finish mm -hmm. that my my little grandson come here buddy you got to meet these people <laughs> is stopping to visit are you a little fussy right he's now hungry. and we just he in the off here and took over the oh little yes room. he's gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> and so did you get enough yeah are you good okay, okay. yeah mm -hmm. and so um yeah i'm gonna come see you in a little bit i know it's soon <laughs> back. 
eat soon, bath time. But uh, oh, you guys, you know, anytime, thanks, love. Mm -hmm. Anytime, you know, I get to spend, it's like every day is a. Yeah. Every day is a bonus. You know, during mm -hmm. the genocide, you're just wondering, will you ever see your family again? I and know. then you get out, you think, ah, it's over. But it's not because it continues to live on in your mind and, and in your thinking and your impact, which is why I just love it when kids ask me, you know, about, have you gone for professional help? I hope it's not too personal. I'll be like, yes, I have. No, it's not too personal. We got to get past this stigma. We got to find these pathways, both personally and collectively mm -hmm. of dealing with the trauma. And so, um, yeah, I am so I'm so grateful in so many ways. And I, you know, at times I'll get like now emotional and I'm like, that doesn't mean that healing isn't happening. The knot in my stomach was when I felt stuck. But now yeah. that I can talk about these things without a knot in my stomach, that's a testament to the, to the hard work of working with the counselor, of journaling, of wrestling with these issues. And, and I, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I just want to say, we need a certain level of intellectual humility when we're coming into many of these things, because unfortunately we have, a, a, we have a, an environment right now that is severely polluted with mistrust. And, yes. and if, if somebody says, um, well, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, then we're like, oh, we don't need to hear them. They don't know what they're talking about because mm. we think that it's this certain or that certain, and it's not. It's this journey and we're learning as we go. And, and, and that's why I really appreciate opportunities like this to explore those stories. And then, you know, as you're, as you're zeroing in on the mediation committees, that's real stuff. That's stuff that is happening here. And that, that's, that's stuff that I asked a friend of mine, you know, you and your wife are getting a divorce. You really want a judge to decide where your kids are going? Or, or could you could you come to a mediator and and you know if that fails you can go to a judge but this idea of really um working at the closest level and the most personal level and and empowering not taking it out of the hands of the of the mother and father whose children they care so much about but empowering those hands mm -hmm. that to me is super exciting okay thank yeah. you Thank you, Gail. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you too. Yeah. I think we have time for two more questions. I have a question. Sure. Am I saying this right, Ekta? Yeah. I'm actually Adara's student. Um, okay. So um, I don't even know how to ask this question, but to uh, this this happened to to me at work today um, when my boss had asked me um, something in regards to regrets. And I thought, and uh, you know, just listening to you and you did an amazing job. And I'm telling, this is just, it's, it's a lot to listen to, you know, it's a, for someone who doesn't really know uh, much, but do you ever think that if you, if you could go back in time, would you ever change your decision of not leaving? You know, everything inside me wants to say, no, I would not change it. Um, at the same time, I think it would be naive to think I could answer that with 100% certainty. Some of the reasons, though, now that I would stay are in addition to reasons that I stayed before. Reasons that I stayed before um, very much... Uh, were around the the two people in our home, the two Rwandan young people in our home, around uh, a joint decision that my wife and I made together. I didn't try to convince her. She is more of a rule follower. Some of our personalities, you know how opposites kind of attract at times. Yeah. And, and so for her, the idea of going against, you know, the American government's orders was like, you don't do that. There's just no choice. And when we talked about it and, and she understood that, yeah, there is a choice and, and that she embraced it fully because she loved the people too. You know, we just couldn't have done that decision in, in conflict. 
So I'm so grateful that it was a consensual decision that was there. But even more so now that I understand is this power of presence. While I understood it to a degree then, and unfortunately, if you start to unpack the privilege that foreigners were given, you're going to find down there some uh, racial injustice, some some racism in that idea from from that the you know the Rwandans. Okay, they are super hospitable. Nothing racist about that. But the idea when colonialists came and put forth this idea of superiority and inferiority, not just them superior and the others inferior, but then trying to divide the people, you're superior, you're inferior, that kind of racial stuff and, and is, is, is horrible. And, and, and so part of the legacy, as I understand the privilege that foreigners got in Rwanda built on those types of things, but, but more than that, that was just kind of a little background for this idea of presence. Um, but more than that is um, like right now, I understand that courage is contagious. You know, you might st stay and think, oh, I'm standing alone. Most likely you're not. There's just other people you don't see right now. Somebody's waiting for somebody else to stand up and say, wait, that's not cool. That's not right. And then you see other people come along. So there's different reasons that I would add to the reasons then, but I, I still can't say for 100% certainty. I mean, if the American government would have said you could bring Rwandans out, there's a very good chance because my family, you know, then we'd have brought our whole family out. First priority, our family. Um, so yeah, Thank thanks you. for that question, Ekta, yeah. yeah. And a final question. Perhaps I can ask a question then, if there's Please. no students who are jumping in. How did you maintain communication with your family during the genocide? Um, we had in our home, kind of like a ham radio. It wasn't as big, complicated antenna system and stuff like that, but that high frequency radio, we used it for our work around um, uh, Rwanda before the genocide came. And so Teresa would make these heroic efforts, get somebody to watch the children and go down to the American embassy and they bent the rules and let her in the communications room to talk. So every day we got to talk on the radio. And then eventually a good friend from Doctors Without Borders, Wayne, he got lent her a radio. So she, she eventually got moved out of this guest room where she was doing laundry in the bathtub and cooking, you know, in the room and everything in this one room to a small apartment and got a radio there. So then I could even talk to the kids. So talking uh, through that radio every single day was just like, as you can imagine, one of the best parts of, of the day for me. Amazing, thank you. And I think we are about you know done for the night. We're at 8.15, um, but what I'd like to do is, you know, first of all, thank you so much, Carl, for being with us tonight. And not only Very well. here with us, but to have spoken with students at Monmouth High School this afternoon. Oh, it's my pleasure. They had some great questions. And, you know, my hope is we're going to be undertaking some restorative justice um, exercises in education in the coming years. Absolutely. That, you know, once the world is a little bit of a safer place for all of us to travel and be together, um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us in person uh, in New Jersey. Would love to. Would love to. Thank you. And, you know, just to let all of, you know, the students, teachers, and community members here tonight know, we do have a set of Carl's book, I'm Not Leaving, at the Holocaust Resource Center. And this is something that anybody is free to borrow, um, either for yourself or for your classroom. We also have copies of the film. And so this is something that anybody who would like to borrow these, we will make sure if you tell us where you're located, that we find a way of safely getting these into your hands. And so I'm just going, you know, to say thank you if we can all have a round of applause. Well, <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks, um, Adara. Let me, if I could just finish with one short little story sure. here that I think captures a lot of what, what is happening today in Rwanda. And it's a really useful tool for me. 
Um, won't go into all the details of Maria who survived with her daughter or of Philbert, who she will tell you is a very valuable family friend. Um, her sons were killed and at every planting and harvest, Philbert is there doing things she says for me like my sons would have done. But as you go deeper, you find out that Philbert was actually in the, in the gang who killed her husband and sons. And when she first met him, she did not that she didn't want anything to do with him totally understand he tried to avoid her as much as possible this is a story of years of building what i would call new neural pathways redefining reframing the other and the part of the story that i wanted to leave us with this evening is after so many years of this working together building homes together as a community and and philbert confessing philbert um first uh, confessing and then apologizing, then going after the other people in the gang who killed her husband and sons until they apolo uh, first confessed and they apologized. And Filbert's consistency of coming back, yeah, well, Maria would tell you, it was a turning point for me when he told me where my husband and sons were buried. So as crazy as this might sound to many of us, Maria gives Filbert quite a bit of credit for her journey of freedom from anger and bitterness, which when I first heard that, I'm like, no, 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 he doesn't get credit for anything. He did all the bad stuff, but Maria isn't stuck in that. And Maria actually, and her daughter, when her daughter got married, invited Philbert to come to the wedding. And I was like, okay, this is just too much to take in. This was uh, summer 2019 that I met them and I'm hearing this story and things. And, um, Debbie was there uh, for that for that experience, and um, I just afterwards I had to say, Maria, your story is so inspiring. But I got to ask, didn't you have family who were angry at you for some at least some of your family who might have survived for inviting him to the wedding? And and she goes, yeah, she's super patient. She got this nice mellow smile, and she goes, yeah, but. His family was also angry at him when he asked my daughter to be the godmother to his children. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, okay, hold on here a minute, Maria. Here's what you're doing. You're doing this, um, yeah, from all the things they work together and this finding the good mindset. Here's what Maria's doing. I put her right in the center. Wasn't your family angry when you invited him? And she says, yes. But then she steps out of the center of the circle and she puts Filbert in the center and she says, but his family was angry when he asked my daughter to be the Ganma. And to me, that I was like, this is golden. I don't know that I can do this, but to be able to step out from my pain and my perspective and place somebody else in the center and try to understand the stories behind their actions, their perspective has got to be one of the keys to the freedom that Maria is experiencing. And honestly, you spend time with this lady and you cannot help but be inspired by the joy and the optimism and the courage and everything. And she looked at me after this little exchange because she knew I was wrestling with it. And she looks me in the eye and she puts her hand on Filbert's shoulder. And she says, <laughs> sounds like a line out of a movie. I probably shouldn't even have to try to add that, but she says, it's beautiful. I'm sorry. It's wonderful to be part of making somebody beautiful again. And Filbert is beautiful. And I'll tell you, when I first was there, I didn't want to hear anything good about Filbert. But Maria's determination, Maria's courage, Maria pushing through untold numbers of nights and weeks and months and years of grief and anger and bitterness and sorrow. And to see her now, 2019, 25 years after the genocide, um, I couldn't help but be inspired and to actually get to the point where I do want to understand a little more of the story behind Filbert's actions. I was stuck in 1994 when I first met Filbert 
Maria has played a big role in helping me get unstuck from 1994. Not forgetting, not minimizing, not, you know, in any way excusing, but finding a way to live again after such enormous horrors and injustice and brutality is just, it's phenomenal. We know as humans, we're capable of some of the most unimaginable crimes. And Maria reminds me that we're also capable of some of the most gracious and generous framing of, of people and life. And that's, that's good medicine for me. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you. I, I saw one quick question. Yeah, I do still have connections with people. I could take more time and show you pictures. Uh, one of the ladies in the orphanage we're bringing food and water to, she's a wedding planner now. Last time we saw her, she pulls out her iPad and says, let me show you a few weddings I've been planning. And, and there was a surprise party they did for me one year when I was back there and introducing me to grandkids and, and just seeing these people and the way they're still able to move forward with such great loss. They just don't seem, at least some of them and I know I have a tendency to perhaps overstate the good and that I think comes from my understanding that the 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 neuroscientists say negative stuff sticks like velcro positive stuff slides off like teflon so I'm like okay I'm going to err on the side of positive but but this idea that we don't have to be defined by what we've lost we can be defined by what we do excuse me with what remains we can be defined by what we do next. And that thing, whether it's me saying something careless to my wife and not being defined by that, but by what I do next. Do I apologize and tell her you didn't deserve that? That's nothing to do with you. That is on me. And I don't want to be that way. I'm sorry. What we do next, I think, is, is, is a huge lesson that, um, that I've gotten from continuing to meet with some of the people and, and ongoing relationships. Thank you. And I think that was a beautiful way to close the program tonight. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And we just, we look forward to seeing you again in the future and hopefully and, time in and person. If somebody didn't, you know, feel comfortable with the question, I think you're super, you're welcome to email me. I don't know if somebody wants to put it in the chat. Carl.Wilkins, just put a dot and spell my last name right. W-I-L-K-E-N-S, Carl.Wilkins at Yahoo. And you're not bothering me at all. I'm happy to, to continue a conversation if you had questions or, um, you know, would like to explore the story with some other co-workers or family members or a faith group or anything. Would love to, love to cross paths again. Wonderful. And we can always help make those arrangements possible. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thank thanks. you so much. Have a wonderful right. night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. That was marvelous. Thank you. Thank you.